We want to welcome you to today's session on Foundations of Christianity. Today we're going to be talking about justification, sanctification, and glorification, the aspects of our salvation that we've won, that we have through Jesus Christ. Uh, I want to start today with justification. Um, anytime I talk about justification, I like to talk genetics. Uh, you might wonder why. Well, you'll find out in just a bit. To me, there's an obvious physical aspect to genetics. Okay, everyone agrees that we understand that the color of our eyes, the color of our hair, et cetera, et cetera, come from our mom and dad genetically. If we understand that all of mankind is physically de descended from Adam and Eve, here's my question for you today. Is there such a thing also as spiritual genetics? Okay, my thought is that if there is such a thing as physical genetics through our parents, then there also is such a thing as spiritual genetics. So what did their sinful actions, this is one of my questions, what did their sinful actions in the Garden of Eden mean physically and spiritually for their descendants who would be us? Well, we have several Psalms that kind of give us an indication as to what happened to us genetically in the spirit realm. Psalm 51 verse 5, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Jeremiah 17 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Romans 3 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we can see from just this first few passages that we are a depraved people. And we receive that through spiritual genetics of our fallen ancestors, Adam and Eve. Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as through one man, that would be Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. That includes you and me. Romans 5, 15, the second part. For if by the transgression of the one, that's Adam and Eve, the many died. In Romans 5, 18, first part, so then as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. That's what I'm talking about with regard to spiritual genetics. So my question next is, so what really happened after Adam and Eve's sin? Well, Genesis 2.16, let's just take that back one step, says this, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, you will surely die. Did they die? Physically, did they die? Obviously not. Adam lived to 930 years old. So was God lying? In the day in which you eat of it, you will surely die. Was God lying? Was he joking? Was he exaggerating? To better understand what God meant, we turn to Isaiah 59, verse 2, which says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So is this the death that God was referring to in the garden when he said in the day in which you eat of it, you will surely die? Obviously, he didn't at that moment in time mean a, mean a physical death. Was it a spiritual death? And if it was, is this what spiritual death means? Separation between you and your God. Okay, well, to answer that, we need to understand a biblical definition, in my opinion, as to what a human being is. Because, let's face it, in our society, in our generation, we've lost the concept of what a human being actually is. We are very, very confused. So let's go back to the scriptures and find out what is a human being. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says this, Now may the God of peace sancti himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch it? Here's what a human being is. We have a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. 
three parts. May I submit to you this. We are triune. Now, that shouldn't shock you because the reality is we're created in God's image, right? And God is triune. He's revealed himself in the scriptures as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is it not logical that he then who has made us to be in his image has made us triune? Body, soul, and spirit. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.23. I teach anatomy and physiology. I also teach biology in the school that I'm at. And in those classes, we teach about 11 different systems of the body. Digestive system, nervous system, muscular system, respiratory system, and on and on. Those are all part of our body. We can tangibly hold those parts. Okay, if you've ever dissected things, you know you can tangibly hold those things. And they are part of a body. We also have a soul. And by the soul, we're talking about an invisible quality that each one of us as a human being possesses. Most theologians believe that the soul is made up of your mind. You can't touch your mind. You can't touch what goes through your mind. In other words, your thoughts. It's invisible. That distinguish it from the body. We have the mind. We have the emotions. Again, you can't touch emotions. Okay, you have emotions, but you can't touch them. It's an invisible quality of your soul life. And thirdly, you have desires. You have wants. There are things that you desire in your life. Correct? What that tells you is that that's another invisible quality of your soul. So we have a body, we have a soul, but then we also have a spirit. The spirit is the breath. We, listen closely, you are a spirit. Now, that sounds kind of weird, but the reality is you are a spirit that actually lives in a body. The body is your house. The spirit is the part of you that when we pass away, it goes before God and is presented before him. So it's the eternal part of us, the spirit is, and it has the ability to be able to commune and communicate with God give you a couple of real quick examples before we move on. In the botany world, in other words, with vegetables and trees and carrots and flowers and plants and stuff like that, they have a body. That's how God's created them. No soul, no spirit. They have a body. In the animal kingdom, zoology, they have a body, right? A lot of my students get a little squirmish when I tell them that we're going to be dissecting some animals. But the reason why we do it is that we can see that they have a body and they have organs just like a human being does. And they have a soul. In other words, they have a mind, right? You can train an animal to do certain things. They have emotions. I want a, I want a bone, says the dog. And they have desires also, right? So uh, we find out that an animal has a body and it has a soul. How is an animal different from a human being? Well, a human being has a body. A human being has a soul, has um, mind, emotions, and desires. But the human being also has the ability to be able to communicate and commune with the living God because we are, we are created in his image. So that's the main difference. So, what really happened? Let's go back to the garden with Adam and Eve. What really happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned? In other words, what did God mean when he said, in the day in which you eat of it, you will surely die? Well, I think it's pretty clear. Spiritual death or separation from God took place. We know that because all of a sudden Adam and Eve recognize their nakedness, try to hide their nakedness, but they also try to hide from God. I would call that spiritual separation. So considering spiritual genetics, does that mean that mankind, starting with Adam and Eve, is separated from God forever? Well, in John chapter 3, famous story of Jesus meeting with Nicodemus. And as Jesus met with Nicodemus, he made this statement, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then Nicodemus kind of goes a little bit over his head. And how can I go in my mother's womb again? And Jesus says, wait, wait, wait. 
Let me explain it to you. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. What did Jesus mean? Well, we have to be born of water. In other words, you have to be born from mama in order to be able to come into this world, right? And he confirms that when he says in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh, your mother, is flesh, you. But then he says, that's just step one toward being able to be in communion again with God. What's the second step? He says then, back to verse 5, and the Spirit, uh, he cannot enter, unless you're born of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is that? Well, verse 6 explains it. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. What does that mean? That which is born of the Holy Spirit is your spirit. That's what being born again means. Jesus explains it very well in John chapter 3. So we have our spirit that was separated from God through Adam and Eve. That's that's called a sinful nature that each human being has. But Jesus and Father and Holy Spirit have made provision to be able to bring back the communion that Adam and Eve lost How is it going to happen? You need to be born again. What happens? The Holy Spirit comes back into your spirit. John 3, 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And that word saved is really, really a key word. A lot of you might be familiar with it. It's the Greek word sozo. It means to be whole. Think about that. Without God, we are not whole. It means healed. It means fully integrated. If you're not sure what fully integrated means, just think of the opposite of it. It means the opposite is not integrated or disintegrated. Sorry, I have that wrong in my notes. It means disintegrated. Okay, disintegrated means chaos. It's breaking apart. Okay, it's in disarray. And what, when we are born again, what happens is the Holy Spirit comes in and we become fully integrated again. Not disintegrated, integrated, whole through him. So according to John 3, 5, and 6, the part of us as human beings which is born again is our spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit into our spirit. We become fully integrated again. We become whole, healed, delivered, saved, sozo. So what is the outcome of this born again experience? Let's take a look at it. 1 Corinthians, Paul writes in chapter 3, verse 16, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Same, same book, 1 Corinthians, this time chapter 6 and verse 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? And finally, 2 Corinthians six sixteen. For we are the temple of the living God. So what's the outcome of being born again? Your body becomes the temple of God. It is his sanctuary. So to bring us full circle, what did God mean by what he spoke in Genesis 2.17 when he said, in the day in which you eat of it, you will surely die? And what according to John 3.3 has been God's plan all along to begin the process of making us human beings fully integrated again as Adam and Eve were before they sinned? Well, God knew Adam and Eve would sin. God knew that sin would separate them and all of mankind, spiritual genetics, from him. God knew his son would come into this world to die on a cross. God knew that Jesus' blood would provide an on-ramp, so to speak, for mankind to be born again. Our spirit receiving God's Holy Spirit. And God knew that all who would receive this teaching and not reject it, he would give the right to become the sons of God. 
Remember the depressing half passages I read at the beginning to help illustrate mankind's spiritual genetics and mankind's spiritual depravity after Adam and Eve's sin in the garden? Well, let me read the rest of the story written in those passages. Romans 3, 23, 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's depressing, but read the rest of it. And all who are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Romans 5, 15, 16. For if the, if the many died by the trespass of one man, Adam, how much more did God's grace and gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Let's read on. Romans 5, 18, 19. So then as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. That's Adam. His spiritual genetics was passed down to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, that's Jesus, there resulted justification of life to all men. Verse 19, for as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Thank you, Jesus. And finally, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. The born again experience which is a saving of our eternal spirits, is called justification. The action, here's a definition for you. It's the action of declaring or making righteous in the sight of God. So God, as judge, looks at us, looks at you. Once you have received his spirit, you become fully integrated, and he looks at you and he says, you are innocent. My child, welcome into the kingdom. So that's part one of God's plan to save mankind. It starts with being born again. It starts with our spirit. But remember, a human being is not just a spirit. A human being is a body, soul, and spirit. So once a person receives the free gift of salvation bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus, that individual is, to use Jesus' words, born again. No longer separated from God, that individual's spirit receives the Holy Spirit of God and their body becomes his temple. But that's only one-third of God's redemptive plan. How many of you know that once you are saved or born again, you'll probably still sin from time to time? That's because even though our spirit has been born again and you are now in the family of God, we still have to deal with our soul and our body, which can cause us daily issues, to say the least. Whereas our spirit being reborn is a one-time event ushering us individually into the family of God forever. That's called justification. Sanctification, or our soul becoming renewed, is a process. See the difference? Justification is a one-time act upon receiving the Holy Spirit. Jesus, some people call it receiving Jesus into our hearts. Okay, that is a one-time act, and that's justification. Sanctification, the renewing of our soul, is an ongoing process. And as it turns out, it's going to last the rest of our lives. That's why we sometimes struggle with our mind thoughts, our mind, the thoughts that run through our mind, our emotions, our desires. They are not always, can I say, they are not always godly. They are not always pure. Our mind, our thoughts are not always holy. That's why we have varying scriptures like this one. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, the third part. We are taking every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought is not in obedience to Christ. That's why we need to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? 
renewing of your mind. That's part of your soul, remember. So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Okay, so we want our souls to be renewed. And finally, Philippians 4, 8, and 9. Finally, brethren, (coughs) excuse me, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Another translation says, think on these things. Things that are true and honorable, etc. That's how we renew our mind. And then verse 9 is an interesting verse. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul writes, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So it's a matter of renewing our minds, which is basically a step of renewing our souls In effect, by doing what? Thinking on these types of things instead of the things that we ought not be thinking or dwelling on. Okay? And then, not just thinking about them, but then he writes, learned, received, heard, seen, practice these things. We get into false habits, we get into ruts, And to get out of the ruts, we need to renew our minds with the Word of God and then practice those things. That's what we're getting at in those passages. Next, as we said, salvation begins with your spirit. Let's do a quick summary here. Every human being is descended from the spiritual genetics of Adam's sin nature, and thus we need to be born again. Once that is secured and sealed in the individual by Holy Spirit, the next step is an end of the process of saving our soul. This is what we've been talking about, sanctification. So how, again, is your soul saved? Let's take a look at this one. James 1.21 It says, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Now, I have a bunch of other things in here as I've uh, typed this thing out for you. I want to talk about them just real quickly. In humility, receive the word. In humility, Uh, we can sometimes go about and feel like that message that I just heard on Sunday was really good for that person. Are we ingesting, are we allowing that word to be implanted in us? As we read the scriptures ourselves, are we allowing the Holy Spirit to probe our hearts, to search our hearts, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me on the path eternal? So we need to receive that word in humility. And that word is implanted. The word implanted in the Greek basically has the idea of a seed that's been sown and it's going to begin to germinate, at least it wants to begin to germinate. But you remember the parable that Jesus told about the seed and the four different kinds of soil. Sometimes that seed gets choked out. Sometimes that seed is in rocky ground and it's not going to be able to have good roots. Sometimes that seed is just not going to be able to grow. So it's really, really important that we have good soil of our heart. How do we have good soil? Humility. We receive that word with humility, which is able. Able is the Greek word dunamis. It has power. The word of God implanted within our soul has power. Remember, it's the word of God. How did God create the universe? By his word. The word is a powerful, the most powerful agent in this universe. And it's able to save, and there's that word again, sozo, it's able to save your soul. I'm going to digress just for a moment, if you can allow me to. We used to live in a different city, and I um, did some things as a Christian that were not, real good. At the time, I thought they were awesome. In fact, I thought I was the next coming of John the Baptist. (laughs) Until (laughs) a pastor friend of mine walked into my office 
And he said, uh, Brian, what you did was not real cool. You're causing an uproar in the whole city. And uh, you need to recant. You need to turn away from what you did and apologize to people. I looked at him and I wanted to say, this is what I was thinking, how dare you talk to John the Baptist in the flesh? What's wrong with you? Don't you know that I am the voice of the Lord <laughs> to our community? <clears throat> I was kind of arrogant. Well, the Lord, as it turns out, used that man to humble me. I went home and I, f I couldn't shake what he had said. And so I decided i got to get in the presence of the Lord and ask him, God, is this what this man said? Is it true? Is it true? And the Lord didn't say one way or the other if it was true or not. He just gave me a passage. He said, Brian, I want you to read Psalm 36. So I started reading Psalm 36. It starts this way in the first verse. Transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There's no fear of God before his eyes. Verse 2. See how they flatter themselves, unable to detect and detest their sins. They are crooked and conceited, convinced that they can get away with anything. And he had me, by the Holy Spirit, zero in, flashlight, spotlight, whatever you want to call it, right in that verse too. See how they flatter themselves. And the Lord asked me, Brian, who do you think you are again? Run that past me one more time, please. I said, oh, John the Baptist? Read verse 2 again. See how they flatter, oh, they flatter themselves. They flatter themselves. And see the result in verse 2 of flattering yourself? I'm John the Baptist. I think that's called pride. But if you take a look a little bit closer, here's what flattery does. Verse 2, they flatter themselves, unable to detect and detest their sins. When you flatter yourself, when you allow flattery to come upon you, and you think, yeah, I'm a big shot. I'm John the Baptist. I'm God's gift to the world, blah, blah, blah. Guess what? If it's not true, if you've fallen into some falsehood, you are then unable to detect and to detest their sins. I praise God for that pastor friend of mine that came into my office that day and confronted me with the truth of what I had done. God broke me as I read these scriptures and I realized I had allowed flattery to come upon me and I was unable to detect and detest. But, here's where we're going, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, there we go. In humility, I could finally receive that word that was implanted in me, that I had done wrong, and then the Lord confirmed it through Psalm 36, verses 1 and 2. That word which is implanted in me, I didn't allow this, the rocks and the thorns and the thistles to choke out that word because God had given me a heart that I wanted to please him. I wanted to please him. And so he showed me Psalm 36 and was able to save my soul, my mind, the way I was thinking. Guess what? You might be shocked to find out I am not John the Baptist. <laughs> I was shocked to find that one out. I am not John the Baptist. I am just Brian Roroff, God's servant. And through the word of that pastor that day and the indwelling Holy Spirit whose job is to lead us into sanctification to become more and more separated unto him, more and more holy, more and more Christ-like, I was able to repent. Philippians 2.13 says God's working in you. God is working in you to help you to want to do those things that please him. See, the biggest problem we have as human beings is we don't want to. So that God, the Holy Spirit, is working in us to help us to want to do those things that please him, even repent, so that we are able to save our souls. And then he gives us the power dunamis to be able to do those things that please him. This is how our soul 
In other words, our mind, our thoughts, our thought life. This is how our emotions, this is how our desires are saved. God's word is dunamis. It is powerful. But we need to know what his word says. Then we need to receive it with humility. This is sanctification. So Christ's work on the cross and his empty tomb draws and empowers us first to be born again in our spirit. Then Christ's finished work draws and empowers us to want to please him. So we begin to cooperate with Holy Spirit to see our soul saved. It's an ongoing process. We begin to think differently. We have different desires which are pleasing to God and our emotions stabilize under the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. Don't you want to have stable emotions also? But that's not all. Remember, we are spirit, soul, and body. So can our body be saved? Did Christ's sacrifice and resurrection provide for our body to be saved? Absolutely. Our body being saved is called glorification. Fancy theological theological words, 1 Corinthians explains it like this. These are select verses from 1 Corinthians 15. Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith is also in vain. Verse 20, but now Christ has has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. By the way, first fruits implies what? <laughs> that there's going to be a second and a third and a gazillion fruit that's going to come. That's you and me. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, that's Adam again, by a man, that's Christ, also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, there we go again, that depressing sentence or phrase, so also in Christ, it's not the end of the story, here's the end of the story, also in Christ all will be made alive. Verse 35, but someone will say, remember we're talking about our body now, can our body be saved? Someone will say, verse 35, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of weed or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished and to each of the seeds a body of its own. Tell you what, I planted a garden this past spring and the seeds that I planted are all about that big, corn seeds, right? About that big. Guess what I got out of them? Seven foot tall corn stalks with corn on them. See, the fruit is completely, looks completely different than the seed. Our body is like a seed that goes into the ground when it dies. And, but it's not dead forever because God is going to raise that He's the first fruit, we come following. He's going to raise that, but that our new body, this glorified body, is not going to look anything like the body that was sown in corruption. So verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. This body is dust. It's going to return to dust. It is raised an imperishable body. So the body that we will receive is going to be imperishable, meaning we will never die. Never. It is sown in dishonor. It's raised dishonor. It's sin. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. So, as we can see, Christ's work on the cross and subsequent resurrection provided for a complete and full salvation for the crown of God's creation, human beings, you and me. Just as God is triune, so he has created human beings to be triune. We are body, soul, and spirit. 
But just as all three parts of our makeup fell with our ancestors, Adam and Eve, in the garden, so Christ has made provision for all three parts, spirit, soul, and body, to be made new through his sacrifice and subsequent resurrection. I want to thank you for joining us for this segment of the Foundation's teachings. If you have any questions or comments on the video that you've just watched, please feel free to address them to me or any individuals on our pastoral team. And God bless you.